we spend money on everything else bar that. So I think that would be a very, very powerful piece of uh, legislation and a major policy change and you'd create an incentive for politicians to be careful and good stewards of the taxpayer dollar, whereas right now every incentive is to spend more money. I mean, every budget, uh, politicians trumpet the fact of how they've spent more money. Um, the only thing they need to do is sort of run a slight surplus, or, you know, the surplus is a measure of good economic management, but so what? if you're wasting so much money to begin with. It's the total quantum that matters. The other thing that happens in government is that we take the existing government spending and then we layer it on top, you know? And indeed, even in your question, you're sort of saying, well, okay, here's the government spending, what would you cut out? Whereas actually we need a, a more sounder framework. No one thinks about their budget in those terms. You know, you need to every now and then review the whole budget. Second thing that we need to do and this has been tougher. Um, the Tax Power Rights Bill has been implemented around the world, or in other places, I should say, not around the world, and other places in the world. Uh, most notably, the one that I've followed most closely is the Colorado Tax Power Rights Bill, or Tax Power Bill of Rights, they call it, which is, um, you know, operates at a state level. The next one that... We pity it doesn't operate at a national level. It is a pity it doesn't operate at a national level. You're a man after my own heart. Uh, but here in New Zealand it will. <laughs> is this uh, something that would be at the top of your list if you got into any party negotiations? Big things at the top of my list are the economy, uh, crime, dumping the emissions trading scheme, and um, my personal favourite is school choice, you know, vouchers for school children, so that you get a choice and the independent and private schools are funded equitably with um, state schools. You haven't mentioned um, tax cuts in there. What, what, what's, the, what's the act um, I'm thinking on tax cuts? I mentioned the economy, which covers two things. One side of the economy is the fiscal side, and you can't have tax cuts unless you've got a mechanism in place to uh, stop the unbridled growth of government spending. So I think we get a bit hung up on tax cuts. Everyone can design a great tax cut policy, um, you know, you lower it, you flatten it, um, you probably give a first few thousand tax free and you drag back GST and get rid of extraneous taxes. The tub trouble is anyone could promise that, but unless they're prepared to get government spending under control, they can't deliver it. And that's what disturbs me about the whole tax cut policy scenario, is that the first thing you need to do is say, well, OK, how are you addressing the spending side of things? For tax cuts, um, the key tax to be lowering is uh, the income tax because that's the one that's most damaging to our economic performance. And the key tax to be uh, pulling down is the top rate and the company rate of tax. They should be the same and they should be low. Why? Because that's what drives the cost of capital in New Zealand and therefore the rate of investment and therefore the rate of, rate of productivity growth. So um, inframarginal tax cut changes have no impact other than a wealth transfer between government and individuals. So if you want to make New Zealand a c competitive and build the stronger economy, that top rate and that company rate coming down is the key. Again, politically, that's not where the votes are, and so everyone's sort of dropping down the tax rates for um, middle income earners to get the votes, but of course it's not giving us the best bang for our tax reduction in terms of economic performance over the long term. Why would you get rid of the emissions trading scheme? Well, because it's a dumb idea. Um, whatever your view of the science, um, and whatever your view of the concern about climate change, New Zealand adopting an emissions trading scheme will have no impact on, on the world. In fact, it's debatable whether the whole world adopting one would have an impact given the models. But um, so what we're doing is, you know, the Rolls-Royce Emissions Trading Scheme, which is hugely administratively costly, um, is going to set up a whole secondary market and trades, is going to establish property rights in hot air, literally, and um, put a cost to every household, to every business, and especially on farming. To what gain? None. Won't have impact on world weather at all. So here is an amazing thing where it's all pain and no gain. 
what's your view on um, how to tax the housing sector or, or not, given the um, sharp growth in house prices and some people's claim that um, uh, that the absence of a tax on capital gains or the allowance of um, uh, tax, the, the, the not having ring fencing on, on um, losses on investment properties is one of the reasons why the housing market has boomed and created the instability. There is a, a, a potentially a tax preference there. Obviously, people you know buying a second home and taking the capital gain and renting it out. But that, to me, isn't the driver. I think that's quite sad. That's what's happening in New Zealand. That you know, we have such an underdeveloped stock market um, that we are investing our money in housing um, and seeing that as a secure investment, because um, it leads to a certain, well, it leads to a loss of capital uh, to what I'd call the productive sector of the economy. I don't think the way to address that is uh, more taxes or uh, taxing capital gains on houses, the reason being that capital gains taxes typically are a double tax and typically you only um, they only come, you only realise or you only pay the tax uh, when you realise the gain and so you end up locking in resources. So people don't sell resources because they can avoid the capital gains tax by hanging on to them which glues up the economy. That's why, by the way, in the States, whenever they reduce the capital gains tax, you see a big spurt because uh, in, the, in the tax collected because it frees up resources that get sold because um, the cost of the tax has fallen. So I'm not a fan of capital gains taxes. I think they are the most damaging tax of all. In the housing market, um, a stronger economy would help because it would mean we could invest in the real economy. But uh, more particularly, uh, we have artificially constrained housing through land planning controls where we sort of try and constrain uh, our cities and say, let's get everyone living in an apartment. Um, that's a planner's dream. And the second thing is we've made it very, very expensive to build um, anything in New Zealand because of the consent process, uh, the RMA process. And in doing that, we haven't provided any security to homeowners. You know, witness the leaky building syndrome with all the government regulations in the world. There's no protection there. So how, though, would you remove that tax advantage for property investing? You'd remove it by lowering taxes. Because when you lower taxes, you, you know, remove the incentive, if you like, to go into a tax-preferred activity. Um, what's your view on the... Um current regulation of New Zealand's banking system and whether um, we need a deposit insurance scheme? I'm not an expert on that. Um, I would have thought that our banking system in terms of our main trading banks is very good. Um, every, every sort of bit of advice I've seen says, you know, this is solid stuff. Um, and I worry about giving anyone an assurance because what you then have is the tax power, that is you and me and your uh, viewers, um, actually guaranteeing a business who will then take a greater risk to try and get a higher reward. And if they fall over, you and I will be picking it up. So I'm not a fan of that. There's no free lunch in any of this.